Good to be here tonight talking about my, my favorite subject. Deacon Joe and I have been on the stage a few times together, and uh, I guess over the last three or four years, uh, we've done this quite a bit. And it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I think about the time I'm away from my family, the time I'm spending, that I, I pick up Mark and Louise's book, Casa Juan Diego, and say, man, I'm just not doing enough. Uh, if you haven't read that book, that is just a, a, a real wonderful book. And, and Mark and Louise, Casa Juan Diego is just a wonderful ministry, so selfless. So uh, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to read it. Th this, this topic is, is controversial. It, it's, uh, I can't think of anything that has caused more controversy in this country, maybe since the issue of slavery back, you know, the Civil War. And uh, people are polarized. You know, you're either for amnesty or you're for deportation, it seems like, and nobody really wants to talk about the middle ground. You know, what, <laughs> what can we do in the middle? Because we're not going to deport 12 to 20 million people couldn't do it. And even if we did it, think about Houston, Texas, where we've got over 600,000 undocumented living in our community. Let me repeat that, 600,000, one in 10 in the greater metropolitan area are undocumented. And uh, what would happen if we took out 600,000 people? I mean, who would mow our grass? Who would work in the restaurants? Who would do a lot of the construction work? Who would take care of our kids? Who would you know, I mean, it just, you go on and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, we're sort of at a stalemate in, the, in, in Congress because it can't happen anywhere but in Washington. So what I'd like to talk about a little bit is, you know, how we got in this mess because it didn't happen overnight. And, and we're not going to get out of it overnight. And ultimately, the solution is in this room. It's called voters. It's called people who vote who let their opinions be known to do what they think is the right thing. And um, I'd like to keep this very informal. I mean, I'd almost like to just sort of sit down and everybody like we're in our living room and we're just talking. We're, we're having a conversation like a family has and talking about tough issues and, and, and trying to educate, educate ourselves on, on all the facts. So if you got a question, raise your hand. Don't wait till I'm through. If you disagree with something I say, jump up and pound on the, on the table and say that's BS and, and uh, you know, if you agree, not, not every now and then. And, and uh, I'm, I'm used to it, believe me. I was honored to preach at four masses at St. Jerome's Parish. Many of you uh, may have been to St. Jerome's. St. Jerome's is in Spring Branch, just uh, north of I-10, like around Bengal and Long Point. And, and uh, you know, it's 20 years ago, it was like this parish. It was very uh, middle class, upper middle class, 90% uh, Anglo, and today it's 20% Anglo and 80% and Latino. And uh, you know, I didn't realize that Monsignor Shield was sending me into an ambush speaking at the, at the English masses because everybody was very unhappy with the situation, and, 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 and rightfully so. I mean, their home values were lower than what they felt they should be. There were a lot of people living more than one family to a house, and and then it had just changed the neighborhood, and a lot of people just didn't like that and couldn't accept that. And that's sort of the story around Houston with this many people who are in our city and document. So I'm going to just refer to this every now and then. I, I'm, this is a little PowerPoint I put together a while back. But, you know, this problem of immigration, is, it's national importance, probably international importance, because the way that we handle this immigration opportunity is how the rest of the world may handle theirs. And, you know, we've got social issues like, like medicine. You know, our ERs are packed uh, because we have so many uninsured. And it's not just the Latino population or the immigrant population who's uninsured in this city. You know, we're up to about 40, 40 to 45 percent of our people are uninsured. And, and God only knows what Obamacare is going to look like when it's done, but I, I sort of applaud what he did because I'm an employer. I'm in the construction business, and for 72 years we've been blessed to have the wherewithal to provide insurance for our employees. Sort of my, my dad said, we'll shut the doors before we quit providing insurance for our employees. And I'm not talking about workman's comp. 
I'm talking about hospitalization. And as people drop out of the system, those of you in business know the premiums for those who have it go up. So in the construction business, we are a rarity. We are one of the few that provides hospitalization for their employees. And it's a tremendous financial burden on us, but it's the right thing. So we need either universal health care or we need to require employers to provide health care. And if we all do it, it sort of levels the playing field where we can pass those costs on and our costs of goods sold. So it's, it's a big issue for that because we have so many undocumented. And unfortunately, President Obama, you know, he's going to have health care for everyone except the 20 million undocumented who are here in the country. Well, you can't just sort of, you know, omit them. I mean, they're here. They get sick, we get sick. If there's an epidemic, we have the epidemic. I mean, so, I mean, they need health care too. Education, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. We've got 5 million kids in this state in our schools, 5 million. And half of them are Latino. And half of them, English is a second language. Their main language is, is, is Spanish. And when I did this, hard to believe three years ago we had a 4% unemployment rate. I mean, we actually had a labor shortage in construction. Of course, it's totally flip-flop now. But we will have that labor shortage again because us baby boomers, as we get older, you know, we're dropping out of the labor force. And, you know, I had my three kids, but most people have 1.2 or 1.3, so we're not replacing the population. And we're certainly getting older, so it's the immigrant population that's going to provide the labor that helps us all get through our golden years. So we're, we're, there will be another labor shortage. And a tremendous number of these workers are off the books. They're being paid in cash. Uh, they don't have workman's comp. They get hurt. They wind up in the ER. They're being taken advantage of because they're undocumented. And some unscrupulous employers will take advantage of them because they're undocumented. And we'll talk more about that. And, you know, of course, national security, uh, you know, there aren't many Latinos who have proven to be terrorists. There have been some, you know, bad actors, but the majority of the people are coming here to work, to improve their lives and to raise their families. And if you look at what's happening in Mexico, Guatemala, and South, it's a mess, especially Mexico. I mean, you know, you read about it every day, what's happening with the, the, the drug lords and things like that. And, and if you go to Mexico, and I've been blessed to be able to go for the last 15 years, we go to a colonia in uh, Ensenada, just south of Tijuana, and we build homes. It's a mission trip. And, and you see these people living in, you know, dirt floors and no sewer, no water, and, you know, and raising their kids and making a dollar an hour and, and living like that. You say, gee whiz, if that was me, you know, I'd probably do the same thing. So you can't really blame them. But... That doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it right. We do have laws, and we'll talk more about that. How did this happen? How did we get in such a mess? Well, you know, we're all a nation of immigrants. My grandfather came over from Czechoslovakia in the 1880s and settled in Yoakum. Some of you have heard of Yoakum, Texas, Central Texas. And, you know, my dad didn't speak English until, you know, he went to school and stopped speaking Czech and learned English. And, I remember when we built our company, my dad and his brothers, and, and after World War II, you know, we had these workers from Schulenburg and Hallisville and Yoakum, and we had Germans and Poles and Czechs and Irish, and my dad would come home at night and say, man, I'm so angry. I mean, I can't work that Polish guy with that German guy because all they want to do is fight, you know, and, and the Czechs, you know, they don't want to work with the Irish. And, you know, it's amazing. In 5, 10, 15 years, we just all assimilated, and we're all Americans. And uh, so we're a nation of immigrants. And I wish, if you ever have a chance to hear a fellow named Stephen Kleinberg from Rice University talk about immigration and the demographics, it's a fascinating talk. I mean, we actually excluded Chinese from the United States and Irish were not welcome. And I mean, just our history is very interesting when it comes to immigration. But something happened in 1986 that really set us up for failure. At that time, President Reagan estimated we had about 3 million undocumented in the United States. God knows how many, but he felt 3 million. And so with Congress, he, uh, Senator Simpson, Wyoming, they passed the Immigration Reform Act of 1986, the last immigration bill that would fix immigration. We'd never have to worry about immigration again. 
and uh, offered amnesty from anywhere from 2.6 to 3 million. No, nobody really knew. Uh, the, the, and as an employer, we had to start filling out I-9s. So when you come to work for me, I've got to have a driver's license or an ID card and a social security number, and I fill out this form and I've got it. I don't send it to anybody. I just keep it in my files in case INS wanted to look at it. And nobody ever said verify that this employee is legal. Nobody ever said that. And they made the social security card the national ID. Not the driver's license, the social security card. And of course, social security cards, we've all got them. They're a little piece of paper and a number on it. No photo, no fingerprints, no DNA, no optical scanning, just that. And so word got out real quick that, uh, hey, we can become citizens if we go down and go to Catholic charities and take English classes and we go pay 70 or 80 bucks, I don't remember what it was, and, and you know, we get our, 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 get our process working, you know, naturalization and eventually citizenship. And, and then when you go to an employer, you know, you take that social security card and you get a job and you get a driver's license easy back in those days. So like a lot of people, they just sort of didn't do anything. They put it off, put it off, put it off. So less than a million people actually did the amnesty. Now, a lot of them went back. You know, this is a, up until 9-11, people could go back and forth pretty easy. And a lot of people just come here to work and then go back, work, go back. And the, uh, at, at this point, though, there were a lot of people that didn't take advantage of the amnesty because nobody made them. Uh, you know, the thing that should have happened, looking back, and what will have to happen with the next immigration bill is we need a tamper-proof ID that either has fingerprints, DNA, optical, something, so that they can't be counterfeited, just like your passport. You get a passport, it's pretty hard to counterfeit a passport and to get through customs with a fake passport. So this was broken. The minute it started, it was broken, and nobody really cared. And, and so, you know, being in the construction business, we sort of hired the people in our community. And most of the people, you know, our high school kids didn't want to go into construction. We hired the Latino population. And they were great workers. And, you know, we had to learn, we tried to learn Spanish. It didn't work too well. So we tried teaching them English. That didn't work too well. So we just had everything in two languages. And that didn't work too well because I'd have an Anglo foreman talking to three guys over here that didn't speak English. And we'd tell them, you know, and when you get up on that ladder, you do this or that. And, you know, safety. Safety is a big concern. But we worked our way through it for a long, long time. And, 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 and we all did well. And Houston grew. Houston just exploded. And, and you know, we'd hire people. We'd fill out an I-9. And, and uh, we'd send in Social Security, 7.62% of his. And we'd match 7.62% in every year, just for years, since 1986. Along comes 9-11. Horrific event. Yes, sir. Before you move on, another aspect of that that I understand from the social service level was to close the border. And Congress didn't fund it. No, they didn't they didn't they didn't close the borders and and and, and you know President Reagan at the time and I don't know how he you know, looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty, but but he really thought this would control the borders. In other words, this I nine this form, because employers now had to register people, had to get a social security card, that would control it. And it didn't. And, it, and they should have realized it didn't. Now, if that had been a photo ID, fingerprints, entered into a computer system, which the computers, they weren't all that great in 86 like they are now, then it would have worked. It would have worked. And as I get further into my, my talk, the, the, the proposal in Congress right now is that they have a tamper-proof ID registered, you know, fingerprint, so that law enforcement will know exactly who is in our country. And, and then an employer like me, if you come to work for me and I ask for your ID and you don't have it, well, I can't hire you. And pretty soon word gets back to all those people in Mexico and south of the border, you can't get a job without this ID, like a passport. They're not gonna come because they can't get a job. They're coming for jobs. Now, if they come, you know, they live in the underground economy, yada, yada, and we'll talk about that, but that's, that's not why most of them come. Most of them come to go to work in construction or restaurants or, you know, something where they can make a lot of money. 
and some of them make a lot of money. So, so back to after 9-11, we had uh, a new sheriff in town, Immigration Naturalization Service, which was the INS, went away, and President Bush started Homeland Security. And to control uh, immigration enforcement, he created an agency called Immigration Customs Enforcement, ICE. And, and that's part of Homeland Security. And so their job was to you know, take care of our airports, our ports, border. I mean, they, they only started out with 169,000 employees and a $65 billion budget. So I mean, they, you know, we, were, we were serious about security after 9-11. I mean, even more than we are now. I mean, and we needed to be. We needed to be. And they had a fellow named Sec uh, Donald Chertoff, who was the uh, director of Homeland Security, and, and he was a tough Harvard lawyer and just tough as boots. And, and you know, his, his, his comment was, you know, the president put me in charge of Homeland Security. I'm going to enforce the laws the way they are. I don't like the laws. The laws don't work, but I've got to enforce them until Congress changes those laws. And so we've been living under that enforcement only since 9-11 without a change in the laws, and that creates some problems. I'll talk about that. So uh, come 206, 207 is uh, really when this just about started. We, we started getting notices. We started getting letters in about 06 from Social Security to an employer like me. Okay, I'd get a letter, and the letter would say, okay, Jose Gonzalez's uh, name does not match his Social Security number uh, under no conditions take punitive action against Mr. Gonzalez, have him contact Social Security. So I'd go to Mr. Gonzalez and say, Jose, go take care of this because your name doesn't match your number. And Jose said, see, see, and he'd go and I'd never hear from Homeland, I'd never hear from Social Security again and I assumed it was taken care of. Well, what we found out after a while is there were 30 million no match letters in the Social Security system. 300 million Social Security numbers, 10%, that's not very many, no match. I mean, if you get married and you don't change your name and you go get a driver's license, you're a no match. And you have to change your name before you get a driver's license now. Happened to my wife after 25 years of marriage. She came home, I'm a no match. I said, well, I just hope they don't deport you real soon, you know. <laughs> and uh, kids would be upset. So what, what was happening then with, with Social Security is we started getting notices. And, and, but they weren't sending out 30 million notices. They were doing random samplings. And so even though we might get Jose one year, we might not get Jose again for three or four years. <laughs> and then another thing happened was Homeland Security, ICE, that says, okay, we're going to clean this thing up. Social Security, you give us all those 30 million names, and we're going to go into those employers, and, and we're going to uh, go after those people. And so what I started doing was doing audits. They show up at a company like mine, and they say, okay, I want to see all your I-9s. And we'd have to produce our I-9s, and they would take them and go through their databases and criminal records, and, and if a name didn't match a number, then they would come back to me and say, okay, Juan's name and number don't match, so uh, you have to fire Juan. I say, wait a minute, I'm going to fire a man that I've trained for 20 years. He's going to go to work for my competitor tomorrow. Now, what good is that doing? It's the law. I lost 150 men like that wow. out of 1,000. I mean, it was terrible. Guys that, you know, and it's not like they're going to take them and deport them. They just moved them into a job where they were making less money without the benefits. And, and, and that's exactly what has been happening since 2006 with ICE and Homeland Security. It happens every day. It happens every day. So that's when I got real angry and very involved. And of course, Joe and I have worked at Catholic Charities together for many years. Social justice is a big thing for us Catholic boys. I was raised by the Dominicans, Assumption Grade School, St. Pius High School, and, and I know what social justice is. And of course, my good friend Bishop Fiorenza, you know, he's got his foot right between Joe and both our backs, doesn't he, Joe? Do something, do something, do something. And, and we have to do something. So uh, we, got, we got very active. Uh, I was very fortunate to, to uh, get on the board of the Greater Houston Partnership with a fellow named Charles Foster, an immigration attorney. Some of you may have read about Charles in the paper with his Mayo's Last Dancer. He was Mayo's, I mean, uh, this Lee Quinn Sung's uh, lawyer. But anyway, Charles and I head up a task force for the partnership called Americans for Immigration Reform. And what we're trying to do is to get business to stand up and get involved in this issue and, 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 and to help influence our lawmakers to, to do something, to, to, to 
pass a law, change it, because what we have doesn't work. And there have been several, op several attempts at passing bills, the McCain-Kennedy bill, the Hutchinson-Pence bill, uh, all these things, you know, Congress, you know, can't agree on what time to have lunch, much less on a bill. These people are very dysfunctional. They do not like each other. And, and I don't understand it. They're, you know, you get them one-on-one, -on -one, they're pretty nice people. But when you get Democrats and Republicans in the same room, it's, it's just a really clash. So leadership is not good in Washington. We are really in a crisis. And, and uh, you know, we as voters, whether you're Tea Party, whether you're Republican, Independent, we've got to do something about it. Or they've got to do something about it. You know, enforcement without reform, you know, we get, you know, nobody in Texas can get a driver's license now. I mean, every year we probably get 50, 60,000 people whose driver's license come up for renewal and they don't get a driver's license. And you say, well, how are they getting their tags? Because you got to have a driver's license to get your insurance, to get your license plates. Now, you can drive without a driver's license, but you can't drive without tags. Well, they're, once again, the undocumented being taken advantage of. There are these little insurance companies popping up all over Texas where you can buy an insurance policy, which is worthless, but you can take it and get your tags with it. Doesn't give you insurance, but it helps you get some. I mean, there's just, the problem is if you're undocumented, people are going to take advantage of you. And it happens over and over. Indentured servants. I know employers who are holding people hostage threatening them. You're undocumented, you say one word, you're out of here. Well, I'm going to pay you three bucks an hour, not ten bucks an hour like I promised you. Go, go see the police. Go, go do something. Yeah, it's over, and I see these situations every day. ER, why are ERs full? Well, if you don't have primary care, if you don't have insurance and you get hurt, and then unfortunately, you know, we have, we have teams from Christus, uh, St. Joe's Hospital, that go into communities and offer care, but people won't come because they're scared. They'll finally come when they're at death's door and they have to go to the ER. And then it gets very, very expensive to care for these people. Uh, education suffers, all these kids we've got. You think about, what's the estimate in the United States, three and a half million anchor babies, three and a half million, and with undocumented parents. I don't like that, but I can't change it. We gotta deal with it. It's just, that's just the way it is. In Houston, I mean, how many kids of 600,000 we have here? We probably got 150,000 kids with undocumented parents in our school system. You know, when they, when they go to school, the little kids, they always have in their bag a phone number to call if mom and dad aren't home. And it's not the police. It's not CPS. It's somebody. Because if they come home and their parents don't come, then CPS picks them up. And, and they wind up, Joe and I get to be the wards. We have a, a program at Catholic Charities called St. Michael's Home. We have over 100 kids under 18 who have been picked up in ice raids and detention. We're trying to reunite them with their families. I mean, it's, it's so sad to see these little kids, 8, 19 years old, you know. But it's a reality. It's a reality. Raids. You know, we haven't had any raids. You know, remember the famous Shipley's Donut raid? Yeah. Oh, boy, that really irritated me because I love Shipley's Donuts. <laughs> but, you know, why there aren't any more raids? Every detention facility in Texas is full, and they're building more, and they're privately owned detention facilities where people are making a profit, incarcerating people who are just here who want to work. Just the way it is. Okay, more uninsured. Uh, businesses like mine right now, the economy is terrible. Construction's terrible. I can't get any work because my competitors are using people who are off the radar screen being paid in cash, not paying their taxes, you know, not having insurance, and, and people will use them. People will use them because, you know, you have a general contractor, then you have a subcontractor, and then he may sub it to somebody else who will resub it, who will resub it. I mean, it's a, it's a mess. It's not like it used to be. Another reason I want an immigration program to ID who's here, put them in a tax-paying job. Uh, a lot of families being split up, you know, horrible situation. Me personally, I've got an office in Atlanta, got a 15-year employee, Jody Claudner, wonderful man, Christian man, fell in love with a Latino lady about six years ago, married her, American-born kid, 
and uh, she had a kid he adopted, and he's been trying to get her papers, and everything's messed up. I mean, INS is horrible. I mean, ICE is horrible in Georgia, worse than Texas. She's taking the kid to school a couple weeks ago, five miles over the speed limit, they pick her up, and within 24 hours, she's in South Carolina for deport deportation. They finally got a lawyer, got her back in Atlanta. She's probably gonna have to go back for 18 months to Mexico to live and to reapply for citizenship, so he gets to take care of the two kids. Well, that happens. It doesn't make sense, but, it, but that's very close to home to me. So, uh, disrupts communities, the kids live in fear, uh, detention facilities, little another personal story, my son, recent college grad, second year at Yes Prep. You've all heard of Yes Prep. Oprah just gave him a million dollars, one of these charter schools. Did y'all read? Yeah. We've got Oprah fans here. My wife thought that was great. He teaches seventh grade Texas history. He's got 140 Latino kids, and he says, Dad, just about every one of them is in a gang or has a family member in a gang. Not because they're bad kids. It's because they're scared, and they need security. They need security. And some of these gangs are just out there to protect the people because they won't go to the police. He lost one of his best kids. He kid, this kid just said this kid was the smartest kid. He would have been either president of Mexico or head of the biggest drug cartel in the world. And a kid came in just crying one morning and said, I've got to leave. My mom and I are leaving for Canada tonight. And uh, he said, why? Well, my dad's beating my mom. She's undocumented. She can't go to the police, so we're just going to Canada. So, I mean, those kind of things are being played out every day. And, you know, I don't like it. I don't like it. Nobody does. But that's just the way it is. And, you know, you may sound like I'm against illegal immigration. Well, I am against illegal immigration. I mean, I think people should come here legally. But I am in favor of a sensible solution, whatever that might be. And I hope we can sort of, when we get through here tonight, agree on what is a sensible solution. Because ultimately, it's, it's you and, and your conscience that sort of tells you where you want to be on this issue. I'm just bringing the facts to you. Uh, education, it shows you how many uh, kids we've got. Uh, 4.7 million, this was a year ago, it's even more than that now. You can see how many Latinos, Native American, I didn't realize we had 16,000 Native American kids, that's interesting, Indians, uh, Anglos. And, and I mean, this, this is the workforce of the future. These are the kids that, you know, if we don't educate them, if we don't support them, they're all, a lot of them are gonna wind up in prison. I mean, this, this is our workforce. You know, I think about, you know, a few more years, I've, you know, I've, I like people to cut my lawn. I'm tired of cutting my lawn, you know. <laughs> Cash economy is, is a huge problem. It's a huge problem in construction. It's a huge problem in all of those things. You know, one of the biggest industries is residential housing. Some of you may be in residential housing. You know how it works. You have a Perry Homes that hires a roofing contractor. The roofing contractor hires a labor broker. The labor broker hires guys. And, and nobody pays any taxes, nobody has workman's comp, you know, nobody, it, it's just the way it is. And it's all legal. It's all legal because we have a system that allows you to classify employees as independent subcontractors, and as long as you send them a 1099 and keep an arm's length, arm's length relationship, and, and they can get away with it. And, and, and that's not right. You know, Texas is the only state in the nation that doesn't have mandatory workman's compensation. All those workers, working in these housing projects. Nobody has insurance. And you look at the ridiculous safety violations. I mean, I call OSHA and say, you know, they, and if you, I'm in the commercial business, everything we do, I mean, we're under a microscope. And, and I walk out there and I see a guy 30 foot up in the air on a two by four, nailing up fascia board. And I call OSHA and say, hey, go up. He's an independent subcontractor. He's not anybody's employee. Plus he's illegal. Who am I gonna find? I can't find anybody. You know, and that kind of stuff's going on. So the cash economy is something that has to be addressed in an immigration bill. Yes, ma'am. Um, you said mandatory. Can you carry um, workers' comp insurance on your own? Yes. Yes, but you don't have to. Now, if you, okay, let's say you've got some workers, and you just go ahead and get a, a hospitalization policy for them. You can take care of their health care like that. But if they are hurt, they can sue you. Under the workman's comp laws, if you have an employee and he gets hurt, the state mandates what he's going to get, and he cannot sue you unless you're grossly negligent. So, you know, to, your advantage. to have workman's comp. Right. Absolutely, but workman's comp is more expensive than some of these cheapy hospitalization policies. Yeah, and the, we're the only state that allows that. And a lot of that, you know, was, was the, the power of the home building industry. The, and I can't blame the home builders. 
the home builders, when, when we had to have workman's comp, were constantly having a third or fourth tier sub that was coming back and suing them because he didn't have insurance, he didn't have insurance, he didn't have insurance, and, 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 and the home builder did. So he just got tired of being sued. So they went to the state legislature and got the law changed to where we can now have a contractual relationship that I'm telling you, you have your own workman's comp and you sign this form and then you go and you know, just right on down the line. Of course, it just sort of stops when you get to that second or third tier sub because they don't have work. They're, most of them are undocumented. They don't know what workman's comp is, but they're good workers. I mean, just look at the money. Our houses in Texas, it probably costs 15 to 20% less than anywhere in the nation because of our cheap labor and not paying taxes. So we're all benefited from that. The cheap, but you know, that doesn't make it right because those people work 60 to 80 hours a week with no overtime. They're, they're not with their families on Saturdays and Sundays. They don't have insurance. They get hurt. They have no retirement program. I mean, it's not a good deal socially in the long term. So it needs to be changed. Uh, we will have a labor shortage. We talked about that. This just irritated me. This is in the Houston Chronicle. I forgot the date. It's uh, 400,000 plus held in Texas detention facilities. 400,000. These are people that just came here to work. Now you're, yeah, I was telling one guy about it and he said, yeah, my sushi chef is in one of those. He was really upset that the guy that made the sushi at the Mexican, at the uh, Japanese restaurant was in one. But yeah, that's, that's a shame. And, and we're spending a lot of money, a lot of money. And, and it's a shame that has to happen because, you know, why don't we just ID who they are, give them a legal status, let them pay taxes, treat them, you know, because we're not going to, you know, I mean, these people probably won't even be deported. Some will, some won't. I mean, the deportation proceedings, you know, they have to have the due course of law. It takes time and it takes money. Just for being, and don't forget, being here illegally is a misdemeanor. It is not a felony. It is a misdemeanor. Doesn't make it right. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying these are the facts. And, and we have to decide what we're going to do. So what would be, wouldn't it be nice if we knew who was in our country and who wasn't in our country, whether they belonged or they didn't belong, they would get the ID, you know, national ID. I thought it was really interesting. The Indians, did y'all read about in India? They're doing retina scans. They're going to re do retina scans on 1.2 billion people. And I had this Indian friend. I said, you know, what do you think you're doing? 1.2. He says, we're starting. We're starting. And the first step is sometimes the biggest step. But, you know, India, in maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, will know who is in their country. And when they leave and come, there'll be a retina scan. It's foolproof. And, and that's, you know, not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Uh, and we'll need migrant labor again. We will. And, and, and I predict within 15 years, Mexico will need migrant labor more than we will. You know, Mexico has got some of the cheapest labor in C Central America in, in the world uh, as far as skilled labor. You know, you look at China. Well, China's been the giant, but don't forget, China put in the one-child policy, what, 20 years ago, 22 years ago. They don't have any 18-year-olds. They're running out of labor. They're building plants in Mexico because it's faster and easier to ship as the U.S. from Mexico. So, I mean, we will see, maybe not in my lifetime, but we will see a shortage of labor in, in here and in Mexico. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if an ethical business conduct didn't pay off? Uh, I would love to see the drain in our social services. Never have we been so deluged as we have in Catholic Charities, Joe. Have you ever seen the demand? I mean, for food, for clothing, for counseling, immigration assistance. I mean, it's, it's crazy. How are we handling it? And, 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 and I would love to see ICE focused on the bad guys. I mean, ICE is spending billions of dollars picking up people's nannies and cooks and people that want to work, and they really ought to be after the bad guys. I mean, that's where they ought to be. So what does a sensible immigration policy look like? We, we quit calling it comprehensive a long time ago. Comprehensive eventually became equated with amnesty. And amnesty in Washington is a bad, bad word. And, and so, you know, we need to secure our borders. I agree. I mean, and I think... We could put more troops on the border. I think we could stop the drug trade. I think we could send groups into Mexico to bust the cartels. And I think we need to do that. Maybe we need to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan and maybe we need to 
get a little closer to our borders, but hopefully somebody will wake up one day and realize how much drug, drugs are coming across this border and how many guns from the U.S. are going the other way. I mean, that's, I can't believe we haven't done something about that. So that's number one. And, and people who are here, if we're not going to deport them and we're not going to give them amnesty, we darn sure need to know who is here. We need an ID system. There needs to be a legal status, not citizenship. The proposal right now on the table between Senator Schumer offering to Senator Cornyn is an eight-year legal status. As long as you have no felonies, as long as you, you work as an employee and pay taxes, you can stay here eight years. And if you stay for eight years, then you can apply for permanent residency after eight years, which I think is another five years. And so then you can apply for citizenship. Now, a lot of people who have legal status, they're going to work here and they want to go home. And, and it's really, in my opinion, people who learn a skill here, if they can take it back to their country and improve their country with their skills, that makes sense. But right now, we don't have circular migration like we had before 9-11. It's one way. You pay that $3,000 to the coyote, or you swim across the border, take your life in your hands, and you don't go back. And, and, and that's not good. So we need circular migration long term. We need this ID. We need this tamper-proof ID. We have the technology now. I guarantee you, if the government doesn't want to do it, go to American Express or Visa. You know, they'll, they'll put it in their computer systems and tell you where everybody is. I mean, check into a motel, they know within two minutes. Or you buy, you know, you buy something at the store, they know just like that. So we have the technology to keep track of people. We need to do it. And they need to pay taxes. They don't need to work in a job where they're not paying taxes. And they need the protections, the protections of our wage and hour laws. They need to be paid overtime. They, they, they need safe working conditions. And, and they, they, you know, a, a decent wage, decent wage. And we need to deport the felons. And if we have this ID system, and everybody, you know, you offer the ID system, everybody comes forth, gets fingerprinted, ID'd, and the ones that don't, those are the ones we just need to get out of the country. And I guarantee you, when word gets out in Mexico and south of the border, that you're not going to get a job with an employer until you get an ID, it will slow immigra illegal immigration down. And employers, yeah, you may not want to mess with it, the e-verification, but you know, we, we may not have a choice. I mean, that's ultimately the employers need to be responsible for their labor force, but we need to have a system to do so. I mean, a quick system. Like right now, e-verification, which we use, it's very quick. You just go on the Internet, you enter the information, or you can just take your I-9 and just run it in the system, and you know within two or three minutes. But the problem is it doesn't pick up identity theft. So if somebody's in your, using your Social Security number and your name, and you don't have a felony or an immigration violation, you're going to pass the e-verification. So a lot of people are getting a free ride because it doesn't pick up identity theft. I mean, how could it? Think about it. It can't. If you're here illegally, nobody knows you're here, and you take somebody else's name, social security number, you're home. But that doesn't make it right. So that's where we are. And uh, why aren't we getting it done? Well, <laughs> there are a lot of people that are very anti-immigrant. There are a lot of groups out there that are zero population growth people that want to deport everybody. And, and you know... <laughs> I didn't really believe that until I, I spoke at the four masses at St. Uh, Jerome's and heard some very angry people. I mean, I sort of felt their pain. And, 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 and those kind of people, if, if you're in pain, you're going to send dollars, you're going to write letters, you're going to be against something very passionately. But if you're living in St. Bernadette's and you don't have much of a Latino population and, you know, it's not a huge issue for you personally, you, you probably just sort of watch what happens. And, and a lot of people do that. So we're getting really beat badly by Internet-generated groups like FAIR and Numbers USA that have sophisticated websites where they have eight or nine million uh, names and emails. And when an issue is on the floor of the Congress, they can flood the, the, the uh, emails to a certain senator with names of people in his district with you know, zip codes and everything else. And, 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 during the Kennedy-McCain bill, I talked to Senator Cornyn. He was getting 1,000 letters against immigration for every one he got for immigration reform. So as long as that kind of dynamics is going on in Washington, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. So these groups, some of them are pretty mean-spirited. Some of them, rightfully so, they're hurt. They're hurt. 
but they don't realize that polarization, deportation, or amnesty, that's not going to happen. It's got to be in the middle. It's got to be something in the middle. So what do we do? We get educated, get, become an activist, elected officials, be prepared when a bill is in debate, be an advocate. These are things that Joe and I go around talking to groups that we'd, we'd really like to see happen. Now let's talk about, for a few minutes, the current state of affairs in Washington. Um, I've been just very fortunate to, with our Americans for Immigration Reform, to spend a lot of time, I say fortunate, spend a lot of time in D.C. I don't think anybody's fortunate if they have to do that. It's a you know, pain getting up there, and once you get there, it's just very, very frustrating. But we met with uh, Speaker Pelosi. We met with uh, 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 head of the uh, Senate, Reid. We met with Schumer. You know, we met with a lot of people, and even the president's uh, people on immigration. And, um, you know, the Democrats would like to get an immigration bill because they feel like it will get them the Latino vote. You know, Obama said when he was running for election, uh, I will get that immigration bill my first year of my term. Well, it hadn't happened. We're going into his third. And, and a lot of reasons. Uh, he doesn't think he can get it passed in, in, in the Senate. Even though he got the health care through, he doesn't think he can get the immigration bill through. And, and really, the longer the perception is that the Republicans keep killing it, the more the Latino vote gravitates to Obama and the Democrats. So there's a real element of politics in this, unfortunately. I mean, they're playing with 20 million people's lives, but it's about politics. And the Republicans, you know, they're a very, the ones way to the right are the primary voters. And the primary voters sort of control who's going to make it into the general election. So they've been very anti-immigrant, and for whatever reason. And uh, you know, we try to point out to them that in Texas, where we're now a, a minority state, you know, there's uh, 43, 44 percent Latino in our state, and within 10 years, it's going to be a, a, a majority Latino. That if they don't do something, there won't be a Republican Party, because the Latinos are going to continue going to the Democratic Party. And you know, whether you're Democrat or Republican or Independent or nothing, I mean, these are the politics. I mean, I don't like them, but these are the politics. So where we are right now is Senator Schumer a Democrat from New York, has an outline of a bill that he has given to Senator Cornyn. And he would like to co-sponsor a bill with Senator Cornyn, a sensible bill. This one I just talked about with the ID and the eight years and this border security, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, Senator Cornyn is head of the Republican Senatorial Committee and he's raising money for all the senatorial races. So he says he's not gonna do anything until after the election in November. We'll see how many seats the Republicans pick up if they do, and, and vice versa. So it's very political, but we have one window, January, February, and March, that Cornyn could get with Schumer. And, and, and why Cornyn? I keep, if Texas doesn't take the leadership, this is not going to happen. They will tell you that in D.C. This is a bigger problem in Texas than any state in the nation. We have, California may have more undocumented, but they, they, they deal with them a lot differently. You know, you, you, they don't have near the cash economy we have because they have licensing and they have mandatory workers' comp, and there's a lot of reasons. And they're a very democratic welfare state, and they're also broke. But uh, Texas is, is sort of ground zero, and, and you know, there was an article, Susan Carroll, uh, a very good reporter for the Chronicle, wrote an article about three weeks ago and she said that uh, she got the statistics from the Pew Hispanic Center that the undocumented population in the U.S. has gone down by a million over the past two years because of the lack of jobs, but the population of undocumented in Texas has gone up 200,000 because there's still a perception that we do have jobs, and we do have a lot of low-paying jobs. And if you think what's happened in Arizona with 1070, they're really anti-immigration law a lot of those 470,000 Latinos have moved to Texas. So our situation is getting more grave as time goes on. So it's really important that we get an immigration bill. And it's going to be tough because I talked to Senator Cornyn's chief of staff last night, Jay Guerrero. He says, Stan, we're just not getting the support from the people. And if the senator doesn't get the political cover he needs, he can't do it. He'll be destroyed. He'll be destroyed in Congress. 
you know, it just, that's the way he thinks. And, and I said, well, what about the Republican Party and the fact that, you know, most of these Latinos would, would be Republicans. They're very conservative. They want less government. I mean, they're just, you know, it's, it's a, well, they don't think about that. So what, you know, the message that I'm trying to get across to groups that I'm talking to is, is we got one shot, one shot. And if you can write a letter, if, you know, depending on where you are on this issue, I mean, if you don't agree with the thing I've said that we need to ship them all back, write them a letter and say so. But if you think we need sensible immigration reform, talking about the things, that, you know, the, the border security, the ID and all that, then write him a letter. Or send him an email here and he's just Google John Cornyn and gives you all his addresses, all his information, and write him a, a, a letter, just a personal letter from you and tell him you've been in Houston for 30 years, 40 years, and you watched this thing develop and you've had a presentation with Stan Merrick the other night. He knows me well. He probably wishes he didn't know me. And, and, and just tell him how you feel. Tell him how you feel. Because if we don't get this done, it's going to be 2013. Our schools, it's just going to get worse. Healthcare, ER, is just going to get worse. You know, our law enforcement, our, our, our talking with Adrian Garcia, he says, we've got to do something. We've got to ID. The, we need to know who's here. We, you know, we've got jails full of people, but we don't have room for any more people in the jails. We do not. And, and social agencies like Catholic Charities and Neighborhood Centers, I mean, they're, you know, we can't feed the, we can't feed the hungry. And, and immigration services are just in demand, and there's so many bad people out there that just want to take advantage of these people. And, and they do over and over and over again. It's terrible. And, and then employers like me, we're desperate. We need an immigration bill so we can we know who's working for us. I mean, it's a matter of security. When I send a man up to uh, Chase Bank, you know, I'd like to really know who he is. And, 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 and so we need an ID system for employers. So that's, that's it in, in a nutshell. Uh, you know, we're just going to keep talking to people and, and talking to people, and it just breaks my heart. And I know some of you like Michael Berry. I mean, I, I know Michael personally. He's a nice guy. But when he gets on the radio and gets on his anti-immigration deal, he just wrecks the stuff that we talk about. He wrecks sensible immigration reform. And, and I asked him about it, and it's all about ratings. He doesn't really feel that way. He's married to an Indian woman. She's an immigrant. But it's all about ratings. So when you hear that stuff, you know, categorize it for where it is. It might be about ratings. I, I don't think, you know, I, I think people in their hearts know that what the right thing to do is. And, and you've got to keep getting back to the fact, yeah, like all those friends of mine in Spring Branch would love to deport every one of them, but it ain't going to happen. It, it would wreck our economy. It, it's an inhumane thing to do with, the, with all the kids, the families it would split up. It's just, we can't make it work. I just don't think it would work. But we can't give them amnesty either because, you know, I mean, if Joe or I were doing it, that's what we'd do. But, I mean, it just, we couldn't sell that in Congress. And I'm not, sure it's the, I'm not sure it's the right thing to do. I think people need to get in line. They need to pay their taxes. They need to earn the right to be citizens. That makes more sense to me than a, a general amnesty. So get involved if you care to, and I'll answer any questions. But I want to thank Stan. I want to thank you for... My pleasure. <laughs> uh, for giving us, uh, you know, a, 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 a real practical real lived experience of the, of the complexity of it from the heart of a faithful man, from the heart of a, a person uh, who is full of love and full of faith. And so we get that uh, perspective and we get the balance. I think we get the balance now. We can understand how, how complex it is and how difficult it is to walk in the middle and uh, to, uh, to engage in the art of bringing people together and to try to work at some kind of compromise. So thank you so much for that. In um